I'm not sure if your teachers told you, but we are starting off today with a quiz. How many of you have a cell phone? How many of you drive? How many of you have your own TV? Computer? Why do you think that is? I'll tell you why. Because over 42 million Americans have donned the uniforms of the United States Marines, Navy, Army, Coast Guard, all of whom willing to give their lives to create the freedom that we enjoy and serve today to ensure, protect, and defend it. In December of 1861, the Congress of the United States enacted legislation to create the first of what would be three versions of the Medal of Honor. It was created for the Marines, the Coast Guard, and the Navy. Six months later, in July of 1862, the second medal was struck for the United States Army, and it wasn't until 1960 that the third and final award of the medal for the Air Force was created. There are today only 78 living recipients of the Medal of Honor, which is awarded for extraordinary valor in combat against an enemy force. We have two of them here today. But before we do that, after having exercised your arms, I'd like you to now exercise your feet and please join me by standing and saluting the symbol of our freedom with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which Liberty and justice for all. This is the only country in the world that subscribes to that on a daily and ongoing basis. My name is Bob Jerome. I am not a recipient of the Medal of Honor, but I have devoted a very serious portion of my life to making sure that these 78 today get the recognition they deserve by touring the country and talking to young people like you who are really our future. Our freedom is in your hands, and it's up to you to understand the seriousness of that mantle that we place upon you. We are here today under the courtesy of the Joshua Chamberlain Foundation, and we will be attending the gala tonight, which will recognize two heroes who very nearly gave their lives so that we might sit here today. 70% of the awards of the Medal of Honor are posthumous. Prior to our first recipient, Sal Junta, there were seven awards of the Medal of Honor for the War on Terror, all of them posthumous. Sal Junta was the first living recipient in 40 years between the Vietnam War and the War on Terror. Sal earned his medal one night with his group of soldiers on their way back from an all-day mission when they were caught in a vicious and deadly ambush. Recognizing that his commanding officer was nowhere to be found, he took off to search for him and saw two Taliban carrying the limp body of his platoon leader for propaganda purposes. He took them both out, carried the man back through withering enemy fire on his shoulders. Sadly, he later died, but Sal Junta will tell you that is one of the people for whom he wears his Medal of Honor. Leroy Petrie, an Army Ranger, was on a rare daylight mission to capture a high-value Taliban target when they stepped right into an ambush. Shot through both legs, he kept the fight on until a grenade rolled between he and his comrades. Scooping it up, he went to throw it back to the enemy, but he was a little bit too late, and the grenade went off, taking his arm from the elbow down. 
he had the self wherewithal to tie his own tourniquet around what was left of his arm. These are two people who stood up and said very simply, service to country is the most important payback that you can give for the life we lead. And I have the incredible honor to introduce to you two of the 78 National Treasures recipients of the Medal of Honor, Sal Junta and Leroy Petrie. We're going to um, have a very simple and easy format here this morning. I'm going to ask each of them a couple of questions, but then we're going to open it up to you all to ask questions that might be on your mind to one or both of these heroes. So start noodling on things that you might want to ask. Um, I want to talk about something, first of all, that, that's probably on everybody's minds. You're in a situation where life itself is hanging in the balance. Was fear a factor? In your actions, was it a motivating factor or was it a paralyzing factor? Leroy, let me, or Sal, let me start with you. Uh, for me, I was with uh, 17 other people and we got hit in near ambush. So from about 30 meters away from me to the back of the room, uh, there was 15 to 20 different enemy fighting positions and within an instant we had thousands of bullets coming at us. Uh, it was the closest and the most aggressive contact that I'd taken in almost two years of combat. But this is what we train for. Failing to prepare is preparing to fail. None of us thought this would ever happen because it's a bad situation to be caught in a near ambush. But it wasn't the first time we'd ever seen this. It was just the first time it had actually happened. We prepared for this a long time in advance. Everyone had something to do, and we all, we had more things to do than we had people to do them. So fear was the only motivator that we all had. Everyone's going to die, I promise you that. Everyone in this room, at some point, you will get old and die. Hopefully you get old before you die. Uh, that night, for us, we knew that not my life wasn't important, but the life to the person to the left of me and to the right of me, and they felt the same way for the person to the left of them and to the right of them. Everyone's own life was inconsequential to them. It was the, it was the fear of losing the people next to you that was the motivating fact, and it was the fear, true fear, that motivated us to move forward, to attack an a enemy behind cover, uh, behind concealment, and continue to move. Uh, so fear was what got us up and moving, but it wasn't incapacitating fear, it was the motivation we needed to survive. Uh, out of the 18 of us, 16 of us survived that, and out of the 20 enemy, none of them survived it. Uh, I wonder how afraid they were. Same question. Um, I look out in the crowd and I see a lot of football players, and uh, you guys are part of a team just like Sal was talking about. And exactly the same thing, you can manipulate fear to work for you. And my fear was basically a shortfall on myself becoming a, being a failure, failing, failing the guys next to me because I wasn't quick enough, because I, I didn't get at the right spot at the right time because I didn't guide them right. And as a leader, that fear always comes into your mind that what if I do something wrong, just like you guys worry about it all the time. What if I fumble? What if I get hit and I lose the ball? That, that kind of fear, the fear of failure was probably the biggest thing that motivates you to uh, do your best and say, I'm going to do everything I can to prevent that failure and I'm going to lead my guys to victory. Leroy, I'm going to ask the next question of you. Um, you wear a prosthetic and once upon a time that prosthetic back in, in my era, the Vietnam era, was a hook. And, and there's been some remarkable strides that have been made over the years with amputees and the technology of the prosthetic that they wear. Why don't you take a minute and talk a little bit about this? Um, this is actually pretty advanced. It has a couple of myoelectric sensors that run off the uh, muscles, so it picks up muscle movement. When I slide my limb, what's left of it, into the uh, prosthetic, it picks up the muscle movements just like you move your, an open enclosure right your other right real hand. And then it has a, uh, what it's designed to do is when each finger meets resistance, it stops, so you got more dexterity. The hand also has a uh, 360 uh, <laughs> motion both directions, which is pretty cool. But um, 
the hand actually comes off. Again. It, it's got multiple attachments. Um, I do have a hook. I have a full set of cutlery knives. I got golf attachment. There's so many different attachments. A bow release, you name it, they make, they make it. And the intent was they wanted to do everything they could to get you to do what you did before or anything you want to do. And our military is doing a phenomenal job taking care of the men and women who are injured in service today. And then uh, I'm sure I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you about. Yeah, I would like you to talk about the, the black. I was going the through the hospital. Uh, a lot of a lot of amputees down in San Antonio, San Antonio Brook Army Medical Center, Center for Intrepid and Walter Reed are two of the primary places for amputees and burn patients. So for me, it was a shock to see just I knew we were taking casualties from the conflict throughout, but I never really got to interact with them. And when I ended up as one myself, that's really when it opened my eyes just how many casualties we had taken and how severe it had been. But I got to see their great attitudes. And while some of them are getting their prosthetic, I'm healing up. I'm looking what they have. A lot of them are getting flames, tattoos that they used to have on their arm, put on their Prosthetic, you can pick just about anything. You bring in a t-shirt and they can laminate it into your, your cast. And so uh, a lot of our veterans the military will wear a black bracelet on their wrist. And what it has is a name, date, and uh, it's, it's for those killed in action, for remembering those that were uh, gave the ultimate sacrifice. And so I don't really wear a whole lot on my wrist. I, don't, I haven't worn a watch in years. And, I looked at uh, what I was going to put on here, and I, on one, I love the carbon fiber, but it gave me an opportunity to wear a bracelet big enough to ha house all the names of the guys I've lost since I've served in 2nd Ranger Battalion, and I wanted to honor our past as well, so I added the names of the guys in uh, Panama, 1989, and Grenada, 1983, and it's... Um, Bob and I were just talking about this the other day. It's, for me, it's, it's a, uh, a way to remember them. I gotta take this arm off and plug it in every night like a cell phone. It's the last thing I see before I go to bed. It's the first thing I see when I wake up and I put it on. And it's, uh, it's always hard when I gotta get, add another name. And unfortunately, I haven't had to do that in a while, but it's a way to honor them. Sal, you said in an earlier interview that, with, that within the first 30 seconds, everybody had either been wounded or killed, that there were bullets literally lighting up the night sky, tracers every which way but loose. Did there ever come a time where the thought crossed your mind that you just might not make it out of this one? I think it did. Uh, at the time, I was I was in charge of. I had three guys under my charge. I did everything with them. We lived with no electricity, no running water. We were in a six-kilometer by six-kilometer valley for 15 months. Uh, we lived exactly how you live in a third-world country, and all we had was each other. And my first thought was always the fear of, of losing one of my guys because, just like Leroy said, I didn't do it right. I put them in the wrong spot. I didn't. I I did it wrong. And when I first looked over to my guys to give them direction, motivation, to give them what needed to happen, and I looked over and I saw Casey was doing everything he had. He had this M249 machine gun, she's about a thousand rounds per minute, and he was shooting a thousand rounds per minute. He never once took a knee, he never once got down. I promise you that does not help Casey live a long life but it helps us live because he became the target. And I looked at Clary right next to him and Clary was lobbing grenades as fast as he could. The enemy was so close, you pretty much have to throw the grenade behind them so the explosion doesn't, get, doesn't hit you. And then all of a sudden that, that worrying about yourself kind of goes out the window. And I felt bad and I kind of felt, I got shot in my chest that night and I kind of felt like I was gonna get shot a few more times, but it didn't happen. And there's no sense crying over spilt milk and, and trying to affect change on things you just can't affect change on. You got to move on. And so for me, uh, I kind of thought I wasn't going to make it, but that wasn't really the issue at hand that night. You also, at your ceremony, talked about the people that were at your ceremony, and you talked about your family who were in the first row, but behind them were the families of two fallen colleagues. You know, it's a strange thing. Uh, to be awarded the medal. 
my night of action, I lost two friends. In my two and a half years of combat, I lost 28 buddies that don't get to come back to the greatest country in the world. They don't get to be welcomed home. They don't get to, to have a cold soda ever again. They don't get to watch TV. And that night, I lost two buddies, Sergeant Joshua Brennan, Specialist Hugo Mendoza. Uh, and they couldn't come back and see their families and see the, the great country that they helped preserve. And yet, I, I had to stand there on stage and be congratulated for the sacrifices of those two families' sons. And it was one of the more difficult things I've ever done because this is bigger than us as individuals. We're just representing all those that do the incredible actions around the world that are seen and unseen, that are heard and unheard. Uh, and primarily those that absolutely give everything for this country. I've given nothing, just a little bit of time, a little bit of sweat, a little bit of blood. I know people who have given absolutely everything so we can maintain, so we can continue to live in the greatest country in the world. And that's the, the people who've given their lives for this country and the families that sacrifice as well. On a lighter note, and this is really one of my favorite questions, and you might as well keep the microphone. How did you hear you were to receive the Medal of Honor? I, I, when I was first told that I would receive it, um, they put me at a desk and everyone else was, they deployed everyone back to Afghanistan and I was actually stationed over in Italy. Uh, and my phone, my desk phone rang one day and it was some colonel at the Pentagon. And colonels at the Pentagon don't call staff sergeants in Italy for good things at all. It's always very bad, very negative. It's worse than the principal calling your parents. Uh, it was terrible. And I thought, well, this guy wanted me to uh, make sure that I don't tell anyone that he called me and that at 17.05, 5.05 our time tomorrow, they're going to call again. And I shouldn't tell anyone about the phone call conversation. And so I was a little bit nervous. And I went home and I told my wife, I asked her if she would come to work with me the next day because I was pretty sure I was going to jail because colonels at the Pentagon don't call staff sergeants in early for good things. And I thought I was just going to pick up the phone and there was going to be police there. And the worst thing was I couldn't think of anything negative I did, so I couldn't even make an excuse on how I was not going to get arrested the next day. And I showed up and it was the colonel from the Pentagon. He called me. Uh, and then the phone clicked and there was secretary at the White House and all I could think of is, you know, what a silly name to call yourself the White House. I can only think of one White House and you're going to confuse people by calling yourself the White House. Then the phone clicked and it was the President of the United States of America. And I wish I could tell you some classy conversation we had. Uh, I was 25 at the time. My heart was pounding out of my chest. I was afraid. I was really excited. I wasn't going to jail. And uh, during that phone call conversation, Ultimately, what was said was I'd be the first living recipient of the Global War on Terror to receive the Congressional Medal of Honor uh, and to not tell anyone about that phone call conversation. Uh, that was the day I was told. It took three, three years from the time of action to the time I was actually informed that I would receive it. Uh, but this is one of the more extensive medals in the process that goes through it. It gets lost through so many chains. You don't know what's happening. You just know no one's banging down your door or sending you into to danger anymore. Leroy, how did you hear? Um, I knew about the recommendation, although I, I, di I didn't, uh, probably about three months later after I had gotten injured, and <clears throat> I didn't have really beliefs that it would go through. And at the time, sales was still going through. I didn't know about it, but they hadn't given one to a living recipient. <clears throat> Two, I was a ranger. I was expected to do above and beyond. But, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I, uh, I, w I was in the special operations community and I worked, I got the same phone call from the colonel that uh, Sal did, uh, but uh, I always knew what was happening ahead of time. Being in the special operations community, my commander, well, he had, he had moved on, he is higher up in rank, but he would always call me ahead, one step ahead of the colonel at the Pentagon, and he'd give me a tip on, hey, this is what's going on. I'll say, well, I'm talking directly to the guy at the Pentagon. I'm pretty sure he knows. I call him up, and he'd be like, "Oh yeah, you're right." And so it, it was it was really interesting in that way. But I kind of um, we work in a, in a classified area, so we can, we're not allowed to have cell phones inside the building. So I, I'm I was working a job where I was working with wounded soldiers. I was at the hospital. I was at finance. I was trying to take care of guys and their families. And they said. The colonel tells, from the Pentagon tells me, you're going to be receiving a call in a couple weeks. I need a good number for you to uh, get a hold of you. I said, I could give you my cell phone, but if I'm at work at my desk, then I, I won't have my cell phone and I can give you the desk number, but if I'm running around, you're going to have to call me on my cell phone and I'm not always at a place where I can always talk on the phone. And he said, well, you need to take this call. And 
I said, well, you're going to have to narrow it down and give me a date. So he narrowed it down to the next week, and then he narrowed it down to the week of, and then he finally narrowed it down to the Monday. And I had already heard from my commander kind of what it might be. And so I stayed home, and I, I was with my wife, and I said, this is where I want to be if I get this call. And um, got the call. It was early in the morning. I'm on the West Coast, so I'm sitting there on my bed, and pick up the phone, and same thing, this is the secretary of the White House, the next person you're gonna be connected with will be the president. And he came on and he, he was talking to me about being recommended and he wanted to welcome me and uh, my wife and family to the White House. And then I thanked him for, asked him to thank Michelle Obama for all the stuff she had been doing with the military families. But uh, it was quite a surprise still. I didn't expect to get that call. I, you never believe it till it happens. There, there's another recipient, his name is Jack Jacobs, and, and to Sal's point, um, he gets a call from a colonel, and he was a captain, and he said, you never want to get a call from a colonel at the Pentagon to a captain. He said, it's really like uh, your secretary walks in and says, it's your wife's lawyer on the phone. Uh, not a good call. Talk about, if you would, and, and I'll throw this out to both of you, um, the meaning and concept and importance of service. I didn't fully understand service. Uh, I grew up in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, a city of about 120,000 folks. And the day that I, I didn't grasp what it meant to be of service. I played football, I wrestled, I played every sport under the sun. You win as a team, you lose as a team. No one gets to win alone, and no one wins alone. We win as a team, as a group. And you gotta be in service to each other because you respect them, that, that you know you can't make it alone, so you need them. I was a junior in high school, September 11, 2001. America was attacked. America needed help. I was a 17-year-old, able-bodied male, uh, and we were looking at going to war. We'd been in Afghanistan since 2001. We jumped into Iraq March 26, 2003, the year I graduated high school. I joined the Army because I wanted to do something that a country said, we need people. There was an actual time we're not going to draft, we need people, and I decided I would do it for such naive reasons, because just because I had nothing else going on. And when I showed up and I joined the military and I found people, they care about everything. I had people that cared about my family. I lived in, in Europe. They'll never meet my family, but they cared about it. And the more I understood that we completely depend on each other, I realized the service that we were providing to America. We as American soldiers do not go to war and fight because we hate what lies in front of us. We go to war and fight because we love what lies behind us. This We're only safe here because people keep us safe. It's none of us. We're sitting, well, you guys are in hard chairs, but we're in soft chairs in, a, in an air conditioning building because other people are going out of their way to ensure that. And that is service. Not because they need to, but because they want to and it makes our lives better because of it. Uh, that idea of service, I didn't learn until I was 18 years old, and it was too late to back out. And that service was ingrained in me, and I believe it will stay with me the rest of my life because we all have the ability to help each other. Service doesn't take camouflage and guns. That's one way. But we can be of service to each other today right here in this school. Uh, I challenge all of you. Find what you do for service, and if you can't think of it, you better start, start scratching your brain because we can do it right here, right now, today. It's, it's so easy. Hold the door for someone. You were of service to them. Be kind, be caring, be compassionate. That's service. I think it, it can't be said any better than what Sal just said. During my ceremony, the president was talking and he said that our heroes are all around us. And just like Sal said, you don't need to be a, wear a uniform, be publicly recognized to be a hero to somebody. It can be simple as listening to their problems, helping them when they got issues, holding the door for them. Just uh, service to each other is the biggest thing that we could do. And it's not only service, but selfless service. Looking beyond your own benefit and helping others out as well. And service is not confined to wearing a uniform. Service is volunteering at a local hospital, at a youth center, as a big brother or big sister, as a mentor. That's service. Look beyond your own noses and find ways to give back for your ability to sit here today in this auditorium. I have one more question for each of our guests, and then we're going to open it up to your questions. And Leroy, since you've got the mic, I'm going to start with you. What does it, sorry, 
What does it mean to you? What goes through your mind when you put on that Medal of Honor? Um, for me, it's, uh, I look at it as the reason I joined the military was because so many veterans had stood before me and I, I was raised, like Sal said, we're blessed to have freedom, we're blessed to be in, in this auditorium, we're freedom to do what we want, freedom to come and go as we please, we're not under a dictatorship, we're not in fear of our lives every single day, and it's, it's uh, because people have been standing up for this country and for our freedoms for a number of years. And when I, when I put on this medal, I think of all those veterans that served and I think about their families that serve right alongside of them. I think about the uh, service members that are overseas right now in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and in places you don't see on TV that they're out there and they're uh, still in harm's way, away from their families, missing uh, birthdays, births, you name it, sacrificing so much. And I think about that and I, I, I wear it and I think about uh, the ones that didn't come home, like Sal said, those are the, uh, the real heroes, those that sacrifice everything. I take my son, I try to go when our base has a, uh, a funeral memorial. I join the Patriot Guard because I want to honor those that have passed. But uh, we were sitting in a pew one time and I, we looked over and, and my son's looking and the families are and they're, they're kid, young kids around his age and they're crying. and. They had the boots with the rifle, dog tags up, and the helmet up on the uh, podium. And I, I sat there and I tried to explain to him. I said, you see that family over there? That's, they're in such grief because their dad doesn't get to come home. I said, I get to stay home with you now because people like him sacrificed and they're not able to be with their loved ones. So when I wear it, it they say it's a heavy metal to wear around one's neck and it, it makes it lighter on my shoulders, knowing that I don't wear it just for me. It's for all those who have served, who are serving, and especially those who paid the ultimate sacrifice. You know, two of the criteria to receive the Medal of Honor is first, there had to be witnesses. So think about the millions of occasions where there was a valorous act, but there were either no witnesses or all the witnesses were killed. The second thing is, and you know, it's funny today, but not in the 1800s, they had to know how to write because it's their written account of the action that becomes the basis of the recommendation for the award. So that adds more meaning to what Leroy just said. Sal, my question to you, and we are in a room full of what is the future of this country. If there is something that you would like to impart to these kids today as they go forward in life, what would it be? It is never over until you quit trying. I'm, I'm a kid, like I said, Cedar Rapids, Iowa. I had no real ambition. I worked at Subway. I was a sandwich artist, uh, making delicious subs for people to enjoy. That wasn't my career, that's what I was doing. And I decided to go out and do something that wasn't usually what I would do. I joined the military and became of service. And when I did that, it changed my life. And it wasn't because I wanted my life to be changed, it was that I wanted to do the right thing for the right reasons. And I challenge you. Do the right things for the right reasons and watch how you change the world. We will all affect this world in some way, be it good or be it bad. Let's make it good. Let's let people talk about you, not because of what you tried to do, but all the things you accomplished just by doing the right thing. I challenge you. Don't give up. Don't quit. It's only over when you quit or when you decide it's over. And as long as you never quit, it's never over. I challenge you. Be the best person you can be and watch how you change the world. The hardest question, you want to say something? Yeah, can I, can I add? Since I screwed it up and got no, it back. you're too good. I, I, I wanted to answer a little bit uh, and give you guys a little insight on my life. Uh, it'll be quick. Um, That's all right. When I was in high school, I, w I wasn't a great student. I, uh, I didn't hang around with the best of crowds, influences around me. I ended up uh, not doing well. And before computers and everything, they used to actually fill out a report card and mail it home to your families. And I was the kid that ran home, got before both parents working, a couple of jobs, trying to support our family. And I'd get home and I'd check the mailbox because I wanted to see my report card and know if I should hide out or if I should try to change some of the letters. 
And uh, <laughs> I opened up, I was on the street, I remember this, I think it was my sophomore year. I, I opened the mailbox, I look up and down the street, nobody's, no cars, nothing. And I opened the letter and I see my name at the top, Leroy Petrie, blah, blah, blah. And then I look down at the grades and I, I just stood there in awe. I had all Fs and one D. And I was in disgust of myself that anybody that saw that piece of paper would see that name and think that that was who Leroy was. All Fs and a D. And I wanted to join the Army since I was in seven years old. And I, I looked at my life and I really, I guess, had an epiphany that is this who I want to become? Is, is this what I want to be represented as? I'm not going to be able to achieve any of my goals if this is what I continue down this path. And so I really turned around. I stopped hanging out with the group that I was hanging around with, and I ended up transferring schools, and I made straight A's my entire senior year. And what I'm telling you this for is that you're at the developmental years of your life where what the decisions you make now will impact your future. And the best thing you can do is set yourself up for success. The way you, the decisions you make, you may be working after high school, you may be working while you're in high school. Those values that you continue to do and grow. I got a teenager graduating high school this year and I try to tell her as much as I can. I know when I was a teenager, it's harder to hear it from your parents, but I wish a stranger would have came to me and told me, hey, really focus down, this is what you need to do to succeed. There's no correct answers for anybody to succeed. All you can do is make the best choices you can every single day. The first question is always the hardest. Who would like to ask it? Show of hands. Are you just scratching or are you putting your hand up? I'm scratching. Somebody, faculty or right there, stand up, son. What, the question is, what did your training look like? Um, it was very extensive. In fact, uh, we shot so much rounds down range that uh, you became surgical. And the best thing that I know we all love golf, uh, us three on stage, and it's one of those things you're not going to get better at it unless you practice. And so we practiced nonstop. Uh, early morning, we'd get up, do PT at 5.30 in the morning, we're out getting ready in the morning, whether it's snow, rain, whatever. We're running, we're going to the weight room, we do our physical activity, we go to breakfast, and then the rest of the day is based on building up uh, battle drills, react to contact, react to ambush, planning ambushes, everything you can think of, and then uh, clearing rooms, vehicle maneuvers. There's so much to train on. There's so many different variables that you're constantly training, and you're training sometimes you don't get to go home. You, you're training weeks at a time or you're training until a lot of people look at this in the, in the real world. The time clock doesn't stop at five o'clock. Oh, it's five o'clock, let's go home. No, it's you train until the training's done. And so it's, it's vigorous and hard, but it, it's for a reason. And I always looked at my guys and I told them, I didn't want to be the guy that hands a folded flag to a family member and not know that I didn't do my best to train them for every situation. And so there's variables everywhere, but you got to train hard because you never know what you're going to react to. You, I think the easiest way is saying you, know, you, you play ball, right? So you practice how you play, how you want to play in a game, but we train how we fight. So when we were out, you know, we're out for 15 months maybe, living with no electricity, no running water. We dig holes, you go to the bathroom on the side of a mountain. What you have is what you brought with you. If you didn't bring it, you don't have it. So uh, continuing to always prepare and better ourselves for what we were gonna see. And like Leroy said, there is no end to the day. Combat lasts until combat's over. Qualified too. Oh yeah, so jumping out of planes, we both were uh, airborne. That pays 150 extra bucks a month. I'm a sucker for a bonus. <laughs> How did your families respond when you earned the Medal of Honor and when you were awarded the Medal of Honor? One thing, vocabulary for all of you, Medal of Honor recipients never look at themselves as winners. My, uh, I didn't talk to my folks much about 
any of this stuff. I, I called them when I got shot in my leg in 2005. I let them know I got shot in my chest in 2007. I didn't tell them too many stories because all war stories are just that. They're just a war story. Mom and dad do not want to hear about their child in, in pain or in trouble that they can't fix. When I called them and told them about this, they were proud. My parents were proud of me since as long as I'm doing the right thing, they're going to be proud of me. Whether I'm doing it fast or great, as long as I'm trying, they were excited for me. And my folks were proud of me. They, that was the first chance they ever saw me in a uniform. I joined the Army at 18, and I left this country, and I didn't come back till I was 26 years old. I spent all my time in Europe and elsewhere, so my folks never saw me in uniform. I think just seeing me that way made them proud. Uh, this was a big deal, but then they got to see the whole picture, that it's not about me or him or him or him. It's about all of us together, and I think that really enlightened them to the way the military works. They were right. I think same, same thing. My, my parents never came to my uh, promotions, my graduations or anything until the uh, award ceremony, but uh, they, they felt the same thing, pride, every time I deployed. Every time I came home, they were happy. Um, they, they always asked questions, but uh, it, uh, my immediate family, my wife and kids, um, <laughs> we're still adjusting to it. I don't think it's um, something you'll ever get used to, but uh, they realize now that they, they gotta sh continue to share dad with the rest of America, and it's important, the work that we do, uh, traveling around and talking about the medal and service to our country, and so, uh, they, like I said, they, they serve right alongside with us. They're the ones that worry about us when we're deployed. They're the ones that worry about taking care of stuff at home while we're gone and we're focused on shooting bad guys in the face. And so it's a, uh, they, 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 uh, they're all very proud of us and all of our men and women. There's a life lesson here too, okay? Not everybody in this room will be a rocket scientist. But the lesson is very simply, and, and, and you've heard it from Sal and from Leroy, whatever you do in life, you will be successful if you do it to the very best of your ability. There was a question, I think, in the back. Stand up, please. What oh. happened during the first days you were in service? Is that was the question? First day in the Army, yeah. First day in the Army. Oh, man. Uh, first he had a haircut. <laughs> Shock and awe, shock and awe. You, um, well now, nowadays you can pretty much Google and see first days in the Army. But uh, during then it was, uh, it was a whole different uh, ball game. You got off the bus, there's guys screaming at you, drill sergeants, get down, get down, hurry up and get your bags. It was just uh, a shock because it's something I'd never experienced in my life. Of course, my dad yelled at me when I got in trouble, but to have somebody constantly in your face and in your business. It, uh, but then what made it easier was you start to realize the guys to your right and left are going through the same thing with you. They're, they're your team that's getting through you and you get through it together. Yeah, that's first day. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Come on now, stand up, son. What'd you do to your wrist? Or who did it to your wrist? I hope the other guy was worse. Question is, why did you select the Army for service instead of the Marines or the Navy? Dude, uh, I was working at Subway, like I said, and it was probably like 10 o'clock at night. My senior year, I was going to graduate in a couple weeks. We just jumped into Iraq, March 26, 2003, like I said, and this radio commercial came on and I was like, come on down, see an Army recruiter, get a free T-shirt. Dude, I work at Subway at 10 o'clock at night. Of course I want a free Army T-shirt. And I went in and the dude's like, hey, take this test. It'll decide if you're smart or what you can do in the military. And my folks were on me about the ACTs and the SATs. And I was like, okay, well, I'll take your silly test versus these tests. And none of it really matters to me because I don't plan on going to college or joining the Army. And I took the test. Then he said I could do anything I wanted in the United States Army. And no one never told me that before. They said, like, you know, you can do anything you want, Sal, as long as you redo what you just did and make it better. Then you can do whatever you want. And so I decided that sounded like a pretty good idea. When he asked me what I wanted to do in the Army, I, I, I didn't know anyone in the Army. I never, I just what you see on TV, I never knew. I told him I want to spit and swear and jump out of planes and fight bad guys and leave Iowa. And he said, that is actually a job description. That's the United States Airborne Infantry. You're absolutely going to love it. And then I joined the Army. That, that naive, like that quick too. I came home and I told my mom, I was like, hey mom, I joined the army. She said, no you didn't, Salvatore. I'm like, I did for four years. 
she, she couldn't believe it. And then I told her, like, oh, they say I'm going to go over to Italy and live over there now. She's like, yeah, you didn't do that, Sal. I did do that. That's how quick. It took me 10 days to join the Army from never thinking about joining the Army in my entire life to, like, joining the Army was 10 days. <laughs> I didn't even look at any other options. Go ahead. Um, I, I, I had family. My cousin was in the Rangers. And so he had told me about what they do, and they're the uh, elite infantry in the uh, in the army. And they, I, I said, if I if I we weren't at combat at the time, I was joined in '99. And I said, though, it could arise at any time. And if if I'm going to deploy and I have to go to war, I want to go to war with the best guys that are out there, the ones that shoot the most ammo, the ones that train the hardest. And so that's what I went in intentionally to the army recruiter, and I. I was going to college for a short bit, it, more pushed on by my grandparents. I showed up at the house and uh, the recruiter the recruiter said, uh, we don't have any ranger contracts available. And I said, well, I'm gonna go talk to the Marines or the Air Force, didn't really want to. But I, I started walking out and he says, hold on one second, hold on. He goes to a phone in the back of the room and he's, I can see him on the phone. He says, uh-huh, okay, yeah. He says, I had to call the Pentagon. There was one more slot. I got it for you. But uh, <laughs> I, I uh, went home and I told my parents the same thing. I was sitting at home. My dad looks at me and goes, hey, didn't, didn't the semester start like a week ago? And I said, yeah, but I leave to the Army in about four days. And kind of the shock and awe to my parents. But uh, they, they, they realized, just like my wife, when I re-enlisted in the Army, she didn't want me to re-enlist after my first term. She's like, you got to get out, get out. And I said, I love what I'm doing. And I came home on my birthday. And she's all smiling, opens the door, happy birthday. And I said, guess what, honey, I just signed up for another six years. The smile kind of went down halfway. And then, but then as time progressed, she realized that I make good decisions. And she trusts my decision-making process. I'm not even coming for that. <laughs> Leroy, though, for actually, He's going to say something. That's why his microphone's not working. <laughs> Karma. Hey, you want this one? Yeah. Factually, though, you should know that Leroy went on to do eight deployments over the course of his career. Next question. Right here. Stand up, young lady. What is it like to be near death? Um, it gives you a greater appreciation for life. It makes you realize not only closer to death, I think uh, just being deployed in Afghanistan or Iraq, like Sal said, being in that third world country, living in the third world conditions, it gives you a greater appreciation for what you have. And every day not taken for granted. It seems like a lot of the guys that deploy, they, they, I know one of the things I looked forward to when I got back from Iraq was I just wanted fresh vegetables because they didn't have that over there. It was so damn hot that everything was spoiling and, and uh, getting pretty nasty really quick. And after we got back for a while, I, I realized that, hey, this is, I kind of became numb to it. Like, this is the normal. I have fresh vegetables every day. But uh, it, it really gives you that appreciation for how precious things in life are, family, uh, just everything, liberty. I think that's one of the, the things that, uh, I don't know if I was really close to, I, I was injured pretty bad, but not close to death. I don't think, I hope not. <laughs> Never saw death. <laughs> There's another hand that went up too. Uh, in the back, there was a hand. Young lady, stand up, please. Let me have it repeat. The question was, what did you take for granted before your experiences in the military that you would never take for advantage uh, now? With the way we lived, uh, it was very different. Uh, it's not, we lived like savages. 
uh, no running water, no electricity, no internet, no cell phones. You couldn't walk outside by yourself because you're going to get shot at. Can't go to the bathroom by yourself because you're going to get shot at. There is no stalls, there's no windows, there's, there's only openness between you and the outside world. Uh, I'd never been in a place where everyone hated us. For 15 months, we could give them cold coats and beans. We could give all we want, and all they did was hate. And I've never been in a situation that, you know what the, the people in the Pentagon say, or the people in D.C. say, you got to keep on giving them stuff so they can keep on hating you. And no one that I suffered with in this type of lifestyle was giving us those orders. Those came from people with drinking cold ice water, sitting in soft chairs in an air conditioning building. And, and it hurt me to see that this is what life is. But that life that we were living is what people in a third world country live every single day. There is nothing that I had there that I have here because everything that was, I had there was terrible and not worth bringing back here. Uh, the things that we take for granted every day just to be able to walk outside. Think about not being able to go outside your house. Not because you don't want to, but because when you walk out you're going to get shot at. So you better bring a buddy so then you can have someone you can fight with. Or if you disappear or you go down, someone's going to be there to grab you and bring you back. That's a trip to the bathroom. And the bathroom is a pit in the ground that once it gets full enough, you just pour some gas on it, light it on fire. And then if you're high ranking or low ranking, depends on who stirs that flaming pile. Uh, none of these things happen in the real world, not in a first world country, not even in a second world country. There is nothing that I was prepared for other than seeing the other people that I was with live the same exact way. And if he can do it, then I can do it. And if he's okay with it, then I'll be okay with it. And as long as this is what's going to happen, then we'll continue to do this. Uh, this life is so precious we have. I grew up in Iowa, like I said, the only people that die are when you get old, you die, when you get sick and you die, you drink and you drive and you die, you don't look both ways when you cross the street and you die. In the world that I went to right after, after high school, I went to everyone dies, life is short, it's angry, it's mean, it's aggressive, it's harmful, and the biggest, the fastest, the strongest, the most brave people I've ever seen in my life die. Uh, none of this is normal. It changed everything for me. It actually made me the person I am today. They say that the strongest metals are forged, the strongest bonds are formed in the hottest flames, the flames of combat. I know no, no fiery hot flames than combat, and those bonds are bonds of brotherhood and bonds, bonds of love and commitment to one another. Uh, it changed everything for me. It changed my entire world to be like that. I spent eight years out of the country by the time I was 26 years old, all for the United States Army. It changed everything. Question. We've got time. Stand up, son. This is the last question, so it has to be the best question that has been asked today, and we're going to vote on it. Thank you. Go ahead. Where were you all? St <laughs> I'll bet that wasn't the original question either. Where were you all stationed? Uh, right, at, right outside of Seattle, Washington, Fort Lewis, now Joint Base Lewis McCord. I spent most of my time in uh, northern Italy, just south of the Dolomites. Uh, Go ahead. All right, coming out of your last mission, is there anything you wish you could have prepared for more? Coming out of your last mission, okay, I'm going to modify that to say, is, was there anything that you wish you would have prepared for differently or done differently? You know, I, I used to think about that. And it goes back to, if you can't change it now, don't dwell on it. Learn from it. Grow from it. What did I do? What did they do? How could we have done it better? But to dwell on it and to pick apart something you can no longer go back and change, because you said the last one. Once I was out, I knew I wasn't going back again. They weren't going to send me. I never thought about it past that, because for me, I had to compartmentalize all that stuff. And that was the time of war, and this is what we did then. And now it's time to shake hands and, and discuss our problems, not just punch the guy in the face because you don't like what he's saying. Uh, so for me, I, I haven't gone into any of that because I, I believe it might bring too much regret. I think um, what, I, what I used to say was, I go back and I would have grabbed that grenade with my left hand. <laughs> it's been a pain in the butt to learn everything left-handed, but then, uh, I look at I, I throw I throw a ball like worse than a two year old so kind of glad I picked it up with my right hand it probably wouldn't have been that quick but yeah um, no there's you can't live life with regrets of I should have done this or I wish I would have done that it's what what can I do now what can I do into the future and how do I help others make those choices that I've made that uh, that can change your life. 
Just uh, one housekeeping note before a couple of closing comments. We're going to ask you to remain. You got a little bit of a free pass here today. We're going to have a picture by grade with our two heroes. If there is a message that I would ask each one of you to take away with you today when you leave this room, it's a very simple one. Freedom is not, never was, and never will be free. Freedom is something you fight for. Freedom is something you don't take for granted. I want to ask you a question. How many of you watch the evening news? How many of you have seen pictures on the news or in the newspapers or online? Boatloads of refugees on dangerous missions to escape tyranny to get to the land of freedom. Immigrants climbing fences topped with concertina wire just to set two feet on American soil. When is the last time you saw a boatload of Americans leaving here to go to Haiti? It's all because of freedom. And it's all because freedom has been fought for over generations and it isn't going to stop today. You are the future of this country. Our mantle of freedom rests in your hands and don't ever take it for granted. Medal of Honor recipients come from all varieties and stages of life, black, white, Asian, some rich, some not so rich. They all have a couple of things in common. They never sought the medal. They felt that there were others equally as deserving or more deserving. And the last thing that they would ever call themselves or acknowledge is that they're a hero. I beg to differ. So once again, as we close this program, I stand in recognition of two people who damn near gave their lives so that you and I might live free, Sal Junta and Leroy Petrie. Thank you.